Welcome Life Science Learners to another installment. Trust that you guys are ready and looking forward to our lesson. Today we're focusing on the revision of nutrition. We've spent some time in the past looking at the various little components and concepts in nutrition. In our lesson today, we're going to have an overview of all of that and we're going to try and apply our understanding to some revision questions. It is important that before we get into the lesson that we have an overview of the core concepts, consult some terminology and as I always say, ensure that you are able to create a list of terms. And that is fundamental to a revision lesson around a topic. So let's get straight into the lesson, have an overview of the core concepts, spend some time unpacking some terminology, and then we will try applying our understanding to different types of questions. It's important that I mention terms are reviewed, and then we have an overview of the core concepts. Let's look at the core concepts in this topic around nutrition. It's important that we reflect on nutrition in various different animals, and we spend some time looking at the diet of omnivores, carnivores, and herbivores. We also looked at how their teeth structure was adapted for their modes of nutrition. It's important that we're able to recognize that different animals have a different arrangement of teeth, size, and structures also vary. And that is essentially an adaptation to supply energy based on the food they eat. We mentioned the terms herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores, and we looked at their diet. We also spoke about dentition and the adaptation for feeding. It's important that we overview the process of digestion and the different stages involved in the process of digestion. We will have a look at the organs of the digestive system and understand how to label them and how to describe their functions. It's important that we look at the process of homeostasis and the regulation of blood sugar levels in the body. We also need to recognize that there are different diets and what, is, what are nutritional disorders and what these relate to when we talk about nutritional choices that individuals make. We spent some time looking at food allergies, the importance of supplements, and reading nutritional information on the packaging. Let's have an overview of some of the main concepts in our terms. So the, the discussion around what happens when we chew food, forming a ball of food called the bolus. We also know the importance of bile as a product that is produced by the liver that helps in the emulsification or breakdown of fat. We also spoke about the pancreas being an exocrine and endocrine gland and its role in the production of chemicals or enzymes as well as hormones which are discussed when we talk about maintaining homeostasis so we talk about insulin and glucagon. An important concept of peristalsis is how the muscles contract and move and propel the food along the digestive system. The, the component of chyme, which is what is seen as a product that moves from the stomach into the small intestine after it is mixed with digestive juices. The villi, or the structure of the villus, is very important in us understanding the adaptation of the small intestine for the process of absorption and maximizing the nutrients from the intestine. Ingestion, digestion, absorption, and assimilation are the key concepts of how food is digested, absorbed, and assimilated in the body. We also must reflect on the term mastication, which is the chewing of food. We've mentioned several different enzymes that are important in the process of digestion along the digestive system. Emulsion, again, is what happens when fat droplets mix with bile and break down into smaller particles. We also refer to the different enzymes and that break down your carbohydrates, your proteins, and your lipids. We also looked at the function of the central lacteal or the structure inside the villus that absorb the nutrients such as fats and amino acids. The concept of metabolism is important as the chemical process that take place in an individual. Guys, as we get into revising any section, it's important that you're able to reflect using diagrams 
And so I've pasted in a diagram on the alimentary canal. So you need to know the glands, the organs, and their functions. And so let's start with a recap. We know that food is ingested through the mouth, and as it moves through the mouth, it obviously is processed by the teeth and broken down. Food mixes with saliva from the salivary glands. It then travels down the esophagus into the stomach where chemical digestion begins. We also see the role of the liver and the gallbladder in the production and the storage of bile and how that then empties its contents into the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum. We must look at the function of the pancreas as an organ that produces hormones and enzymes. We then further continue with the small intestine as the jejunum ending with the ileum. We then point to the large intestine being the colon, which has the ascending colon, the transverse colon, along with the descending colon. And finally, we see the waste products being stored and then ingested via the rectum through the anus. And that's an overview of both the organs along with the accessory organs of the alimentary canal. As I mentioned, it's important that we reflect on the processes such as ingestion, digestion, absorption, assimilation, and ejection as the key components or stages in the process of nutrition. This is illustrated in the floor chart, which I often use to remind myself of how food has to go through various processes to be finally assimilated and released. And as I always mention, it's important that you have an overview of the functions of the different organs. So use the diagrams to be able to have a sense of the different functions and what they play in the process of digestion. Before we wrap up the section, let's test the waters. Let's try and see if we can apply some of our understanding to a few multiple choice questions. I've put in a few. Let's try that before we get into a break. So there are various answers that are given, and we've got to select the correct option. Let's look at question 1.1. Which of the following substances can directly be absorbed by the blood without further digestion? It's quite a tricky question because it refers to a substance that can be absorbed directly without any further breakdown. So guys, we've got proteins. And if we think of proteins, proteins are complex structures. And these need to be broken down into amino acids. So those have to undergo some form of digestion before being absorbed. The next group is starch. Again, starch is a complex carbohydrate that needs to be broken down into glucose before it is absorbed. So that cannot be absorbed directly. We know that glucose is a simple monomer. It's the simplest form of carbohydrate that is easily and rapidly absorbed without having to go any, undergo any chemical breakdown. And we know that fats, guys, are broken up into fatty acids and lipids. So when we look at this question, which of the following substances can be directly absorbed? The answer here is C. And if you reflect on what many energy drinks contain, they contain large amounts of glucose, and that is so that the glucose can be readily absorbed without having to go through chemical breakdown. And that is what gives the release of energy immediately when consuming an energy drink. And so guys, again, it's important that when you read a multiple choice question that you're able to read through the options, eliminate the obvious ones, and then focus on the ones that are most likely to be correct. And it's important that you apply that understanding in the context of multiple choice questions. One more before we have a little break. The question reads, the concentration of which of the following substances are normally higher in the hepatic portal vein than in most other veins in the human body? So guys, if we look at the hepatic portal vein, the word hepatic portal vein refers to the vein that is coming from the liver. Okay, so if we look at that, guys, remember that the function of the liver is to break down excess amino acids. So we refer to that as the deamination of excess amino acids. It also plays an important role in the removal of toxins from the body. So let's look at this. 
So oxygen, yes, there would be less oxygen because obviously the cells in the liver use some oxygen. Glucose. Again, remember that the liver plays an important role in taking the glucose and storing it as glycogen. So yes, a large amount of glucose can be stored. Remember that this is the hepatic portal vein that we're talking about. And this would have a larger amount of urea. Remember that urea is a waste product that is produced. And finally, carbon dioxide. So let's go back to that question and try and unpack which is the most correct answer. And I'm going to read this for the benefit of us all. So the concentration of which of the following substances are normally higher in the hepatic portal vein than in most other veins in the human body. Guys, remember that the vein is going to carry blood away from the liver. And the liver predominantly is going to remove excess glucose. Yes, it's also going to produce urea. And that we would see as being significantly higher when compared to any other part in the, or vessel in the body. So the answer for this question would be C. So guys, I've presented to you with two multiple choice questions. Often these answers can be very confusing. It requires that you reflect on your understanding and apply your collective understanding of the various components and answer these questions. Guys, you've been good. Let's have a little break and when we get back, we will try and do a few more revision questions to, to sharpen our understanding in this section. See you in a bit. Welcome back Life Science Learners. Let's continue with our revision lesson. In our segment now, we're focusing on some revision questions on nutrition. I trust that you're going to engage with me, are able to write down some of your answers, and check these as we work through them. Let's get straight into the lesson and apply some of our understanding by attempting some questions based on terminology. Right, so give the correct biological terms for each of the following descriptions. Write only the term next to the question numbers. Guys, it's important that when you have to write down terms that you read through the descriptions carefully. Often in questions that are confusing, there might be two or three terms that are similar. And hence, if you clear around understanding the key components of a description, you are then able to reflect on your list of terms and find the correct one. Remember that it's important that you reflect and write down your most correct answer. If in doubt, Write down both the options and reflect on them before you finalize and put your answer down. So let's try that in this activity. So the disorder resulting from insufficient intake of proteins. So guys, during our lesson when we spoke about nutritional disorders, we mentioned that there were two disorders that was as a result of insufficient carbohydrates and proteins. The one disorder that we referred to was kwashioka. And kwashioka is a disorder which is a diet that is lacking in proteins. We also know that another type of disorder was called marasmus. And in that disorder, we realized that individuals had a diet lacking in carbohydrates. So the answer for this is kwashioka. Let's move on to the next one. 2.2. A type of malnutrition in which the person consumes large quantities of high energy food. As I mentioned earlier on, we spoke of kwashioka being a disorder in which there was large amounts of protein. The other condition in which individuals consume large amounts of carbohydrates and lack the other essential nutrients is called marasmus. And I'll spell that out for you. So it's called marasmus. Okay, so well done if you were able to get that. Let's move on to a few more. The ejection of solid waste from the body. Guys, that's the last process when we talk about nutrition. And so the ejection refers to ejection. And ejection was, again, the removal of parts of the body that are not required at the end of digestion. Well done if you're able to get that. 
Let's look at 2.4, the tiny finger-like projections in the small intestine. And guys, if we go and look at the lumen of the small intestine, we see these transverse folds, and those finger-like projections that extend into the lumen are called the villus. Okay, And those are structures that increase the surface area on the internal surface of the small intestine. 2.5, the process where the products of digestion become part of the protoplasm of the body cells. Let's try and unpack that. Some confusing words, but essentially let's unpack what the statement draws to. So where the products of digestion become part of the protoplasm, another word for protoplasm is the internal contents of the cell. When they get into that, we say that that is absorption. So the absorption of the nutrients into the protoplasm or the cytoplasm is the process when they become part of the cell. Okay, let's move on to 2.6. Substances secreted by the liver to emulsify fats. So guys, remember that fats are first broken down mechanically by a process called emulsification, which is essentially breaking down the fats into smaller droplets. And to assist that process, we have the liver that produces bile. So the bile is that bile salt that is released that helps to break down the larger fat molecules into smaller molecules, which then undergo the enzymatic digestion process. 2.7, the form in which excess glucose is stored in humans. Guys, we mentioned that when the body consumes or, or uses a large num amount of glucose, that the excess glucose is stored in the liver. And that complex glucose molecule which is stored in the liver is called glycogen. And that is a complex carbohydrate which is stored in the liver and muscle cells. 2.8. The wave-like contractions of the muscles of the alimentary canal that move food along. Guys, remember that we spoke about the muscular contractions that allow for the propulsion of the bolus. And that muscular contraction again refers to the term that is fundamental to moving food along the digestive system. And if you recollect, it starts with the letter P, and we refer to that context or that term as peristalsis. So peristalsis is what propels food along the digestive system. 2.9. The ball of chewed food mixed with saliva formed in preparation for swallowing. Guys, remember that during the process of peristalsis, when food is mixed with saliva, it moves down the esophagus. It's chewed into a little ball, and that ball of food is called the bolus. Okay, well done if you recollected that. 2.10. The muscular tube that connects the mouth cavity to the stomach. Guys, we have a tube that then transports the food all the way to the stomach before it moves into the small intestine. Here we have the mouth that allows for the food to be prepared and that moves down the tube. That tube in which the food moves through is called the esophagus and that is the first part of the alimentary canal that connects the mouth to the muscular stomach. And so guys, that's a wrap for looking at terms. Let's try and attempt a few more questions of a different type. Question 3. Indicate whether each of the descriptions in column 1 applies to A only, B only, both A and B, none of the items in column 2. Okay, write A only, B only, both A and B, or none next to the question number. So guys, these questions are often very confusing because for each response, there are four possible answers. And this requires that you 
read through the descriptions and you look at the terms and that you analyze the relevance of each one. And then you've got to then try and interpret whether any one of these four options or which one of these four options are the most correct of combinations. So again, very confusing when you have four possible options for each answer. Let's attempt that. Again, it's a good way to measure your understanding of any concept. So, substances that need to be digested before absorption. So, what is it that needs to be digested before absorption? Guys, amino acids are the simplest molecules. They've been already digested. And so they're easily absorbed. Glucose, again, is its simplest form. So let's look at it. Are these substances that need to be digested before absorbed? No. If you think about it, amino acids are the product of protein digestion. Glucose is a product of carbohydrate digestion. So both of these do not need to be broken down any further and hence can be absorbed easily after digestion. So the answer here, if you go back, will be none of terms, none of these terms A and B. Okay, let's move on to the next statement. A lymph vessel in the villus of the small intestine. So guys, if we go back to the villi, you know that in the middle you've got that central lacteal, which is part of the lymph vessel. And that is important in the absorption of the digested fat. Let's see. So we talk about the lacteal and the lymphatic node. Now both of these terms link to the lymph system. Unfortunately, it is only the lacteal that is responsible for the absorption. So the answer here will be A only and not B. The lymphatic nodes are present around the body but not in the villus. Okay, let's look at the third option. The enzymes secreted by the pancreas. Guys, remember that the enzymes produced by the pancreas are released into the duodenum. We also know that the pancreas produces hormones. Let's look at that. So we've got proteases and your carbohydrases. So the pancreas produces enzymes that are responsible for completing the carbohydrate digestion as well as completing protein digestion. So both A and B are a group of enzymes that are released by the pancreas that are important enzymes in completing the process of digestion. Let's look at the fourth statement. The structure where chemical digestion does not take place. Focus on the word does not take place. A, the esophagus. B, the large intestine. I'm going to go back to that statement, does not take place. We know that chemical digestion takes place in the intestine. That's correct. However, the esophagus is a tube that connects the, the mouth to the stomach. And it is in that tube that no digestion takes place and purely food moving through. So the answer here will be A only. Welcome back Life Science Learners. We're continuing with our revision lesson on nutrition. I trust that you're now able to reflect on some of the concepts and apply that in our activities. Let's go and try some of that. I hope that you can attempt to answer these questions, write them down as we work through and reflect on your answers. Let's get straight into that. Activity 1. Study the diagram of the digestive system and answer the questions that follow. Guys, we often know that in a question based on the digestive system that it is important that you understand the digestive system. So here we've got the digestive system and we've got to label the parts which is most probably going to be the next question. Let's look at that. So question one, as anticipated, provide labels for parts labeled A to K, 11 marks. Well guys, Sometimes in an exam or in an assessment, the examiner might ask you to label a few parts. 
But I often advise my learners is, if you see a whole lot of parts that are labeled, if you can quickly annotate that diagram, or in other words, write down the parts as soon as you see some labels on them, it does help you as you get into the rest of the question when you have to refer to the diagram and respond to parts that have been indicated with alphabets. So let's label this diagram, and as we go through that, it will help us to recollect the structure of the digestive system, and hopefully that can remind you of the importance of using diagrams to learn important processes like in the digestive system. So, as we look at this diagram, we can see various parts that have been labeled. So, I'm going to encourage you to assist me as we do this. So, A points to this tube that connects to the stomach, and that's the tube that we refer to as the esophagus. And guys, remember that this is where the process of the bolus, which is that ball of food, moves down through a process called peristalsis. Label line B points to this organ here, which is a muscular organ, and that organ is the stomach. It is in the stomach that the first process of chemical digestion of proteins begin. The food then mixes with the gastric juices and moves down the first part of the small intestine, which is labeled C. And that is the small intestine, but specifically the duodenum. And it's important that you guys are able to differentiate the different parts of the small intestine. Namely, the first part being this C-shaped structure called the duodenum, the middle part called the jejunum, and then the last bit, which is the ileum, which is which connects to the large intestine. Right, so let's move on to the next part. D points to this leaf-like shaped structure and that is the pancreas. And if we recollect the function of the pancreas, it plays an important role in the production of enzymes along with hormones. And both of these play an important role in digestion as well as maintaining homeostasis in terms of the balance of blood sugar levels in the body. E points to the large intestine, and that's the colon. And if you want to be very specific, this part is specifically the descending colon, so I'm going to put that in brackets. So it's the descending colon, essentially pointing to that part that is taking the waste products down. E points to the middle bit of the small intestine, and that is the jejunum, and that's the middle bit of the small intestine. Let's go further down. E points to the last part of the small of the large intestine called the rectum and that is where food or the waste products are temporarily stored and we have H which is the opening of the alimentary canal where the process of ejection happens and that is pointing to the anus. Guys we then see I which again points to part of the large intestine which is taking the waste products now further up and that is the ascending. So again, climbing up. So moving up is the ascending colon. And then if we go further up to J, J points to this little structure here, which is an extension from the liver, and that's the gall bladder. And that is the structure in which the bile, which is produced by the liver, is temporarily stored. And finally, we have structure K, which is this triangular-shaped structure in close proximity to the stomach, which is called the liver. So guys, in this simple activity, we were able to review the different parts. Remember that the digestive system contains a whole lot of parts that are important for food to move through. But along with that, we have the accessory organs such as the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, which produce substances that are important in assisting the digestive system in carrying out what we refer to as the complete process of chemical digestion. Right, so again, I've enlarged in that diagram for your benefit. Let's move on to some more questions based on this diagram. Give the letter of the structure that produces bile. And as you noted, as I went through labeling these parts, I was able to very quickly recollect the structure and function of different parts. 
So we mentioned producing bile. Guys, remember that the liver produces the bile. However, it is stored and released temporarily from the gallbladder. So give the letter of the structure, guys. So please do not give the name because the examiner or the assessor is trying to establish if you are able to identify from the diagram which is the part. And hence, it's important that you now answer the question. So the letter that produces the bile, again, it's the liver that produces the bile, and the structure that we have is pointing to the liver is structure K. Pre controls blood glucose level. Guys, we spoke about the importance of the pancreas in producing hormones, and these hormones play an important role in regulating the blood glucose level. So in this diagram, that's the pancreas, and it is labeled with the letter D. So the structure that is labeled D is the pancreas, in this case, controlling blood sugar levels. A few more. Give the letter of the structure that absorbs most nutrients. So guys, remember that the absorption of nutrients happens in the small intestine. So that's going to be letter F. And so that is where the jejunum absorbs most of the nutrients that have been chemically digested as they move into the duodenum and the middle part of the small intestine. Absorbs most of the water. And guys, the last part of the alimentary canal, which is the colon, absorbs most of the water. And most of that water is absorbed in the ascending colon. So you could put down the letter I for that option. Okay. Question three. Name the structure where chime can be found. Guys, the concept of chime again comes up from our understanding of terms. Remember we spoke about the food that moves into the stomach and that mixes with the gastric juices. Once that mixture is produced, it moves from the stomach into the small intestine. So when it is mixed in the stomach, that mixture of gastric juices with food is called chyme. So the structure where chyme is found is the stomach. And in this case, it's labeled with the letter B. Okay. Guys, with the stomach behind me, I think you need a little break. Let's grab some energy, get in some calories into that stomach, and then we get back and we'll focus on a few more revision questions. See you in a little bit. Welcome back, life science learners. In our segment now, we wrap up our revision on nutrition. Let's get straight into the lesson and try and attempt some questions based on deeper understanding around processes like the regulation of blood sugar levels. I have a question for us to work on. Let's get straight into that and try and analyze how questions based on the regulation of blood sugar levels can be assessed in an assessment. So the question reads, the graph below shows the results of a glucose tolerance test on a healthy individual. Person A and on a diabetic person B. After fasting for 10 hours, they each were given a drink of glucose solution containing 50 grams of glucose. The amount of glucose in their blood was then measured every 30 minutes for the next three hours. So guys, it's important to have some context to a question like this. Essentially, it's important to understand that sometimes individuals that go in for a glucose tolerance test have to undergo a period of fasting. And that means essentially that the previous night would have been the last meal that they would have had. They would have slept through the night, got up the next morning, and then gone into a clinic or a facility that would have tested their blood glucose level. And that's essentially important to be able to establish what the baseline glucose level is. Notice that these two individuals, person A, being a person that is not affected with diabetes, and person B, 
a person affected with diabetes, we're then both given a fixed or a known amount of glucose solution. And that then was monitored over the next three hours in terms of how that level would have be affected in their blood. So let's look at the graph as we unpack this question. So the graph then illustrates the results of the glucose tolerance test of the healthy individual person A and a diabetic individual. Let's look at the key. So the healthy individual is indicated with triangles. So that's the healthy individual here. And if we just outline that there, if we're looking at person B is the diabetic, that's that line and it, it's indicated with squares. So that's the individual there. Okay. And we have one more line, which basically shows you a solid line with a circle indicating the normal blood glucose level, which is seen at this height there. Guys, this is measured over a period of time from minutes zero to 210. So that's over a period of time. And on the y-axis, the blood glucose levels are measured in milligrams per deciliter. So that is essentially the stats or the information that was collected regularly every 30 minutes over a period of time between persons A and B. And then that is then compared to the normal blood glucose level, which we see as the baseline value. So guys, clearly we can see from this graph, there's a significant difference in the level of blood glucose between person A who is healthy and person B who is a person that is suffering from diabetic or diabetes or is affected by diabetes. Let's move on to this question. What was the greatest concentration of glucose in the diabetic's blood? Again, guys, the question is very pointed to the diabetic individual. So if we have to look at that, so it's going to be graph, which indicates the ones with the squares. If we look at the greatest concentration was this point here. And so we've got to use the information and with your rulers, extrapolate that onto the y axis. And in this case, it is 300. Guys, the answer is not complete yet. It's important that we're able to include the unit that is given on the y axis. So in this case, it is 300 milligrams per deciliter. It might not make sense to you, the unit, but it's important that you provide a unit for your answer. And that is only when your answer can be accepted to be correct. So in this case, it's a simple extrapolation of data from the graph. Let's move on to a few more questions on this. From the graph again, determine how long it would take for the glucose concentration of the following. A, the healthy person to return to the level when the glucose solution was consumed. So in the healthy person, how long does it take for the glucose levels to return to the normal when the individual consumed it? So if you look at the initial amount was just uh, uh, under 100 milligrams, and it obviously reached that value after a specific time period. We've basically got to look at how long did it take for it to get back to normal. And this was approximately, if you plot that down, 150 minutes. So that took the individual 150 minutes to bring down the blood sugar levels back to what it initially was. Let's move on to B. The diabetic person to return to the level when the glucose solution was consumed. So when the individual had consumed the glucose, it was 200 milligrams. And if you look along the graph, this was when it returned back to normal. Again, you've got to determine how long did it take from that point. Again, if you extrapolate that down to the x-axis, you can see that it took that individual 210 minutes. So guys, clearly we can see that between both these individuals, this individual, which is the healthy individual, took much less time to bring the blood sugar levels back to what it originally was before or at the time when they consumed the sugar. However, the individual that is diabetic took much longer. And this essentially points to 
the struggles that a diabetic individual will have in maintaining their blood sugar levels and bringing them back to a normal level. An interesting difference that we needed to note. Let's move on to question three. What effect would injecting insulin into the diabetic person have on the results of the test? So guys, remember that an individual that is diabetic has, the, has a problem with, again, being able to absorb the blood glucose into the cells and using that. However, we do know that insulin as a hormone will assist the individual to be able to allow the insulin to open up the cells so that the glucose can then move through from the blood vessels into the cells. So what effect would injecting insulin into the diabetic person have on the results of this test? It will reduce the amount of blood glucose in the blood vessels, therefore decreasing the levels of glucose in the bloodstream. Right. Question four, what is the function of insulin? Guys, insulin is a hormone produced by the pancreas. Insulin, again, is released into the bloodstream. And as it travels into the bloodstream, it is able to allow the cells to absorb the glucose, therefore decreasing the glucose in the, in the blood vessels, allowing for the cells to absorb the glucose so that it can be used for cellular respiration. So that would be the function of insulin. It allows for the blood to be absorbed, for the glucose to be absorbed into the cells, therefore decreasing the blood glucose levels. Often learners explain that the function of insulin is to decrease the blood glucose level. That is correct. However, you need to understand that it's the insulin that allows for the glucose to be absorbed into the cells which then ultimately reduces the level of glucose in the bloodstream. Right, explain briefly why insulin, which is a protein, is injected into a diabetic person rather than given orally. And this is a two-mark question. And I'm going to pause at that point because there's a lot of information that's given to us around insulin. So guys, insulin is a hormone. And this specific hormone, again, is protein-based. Remember that insulin is injected into the bloodstream, and that then travels into the bloodstream to the cells which allow it to absorb the glucose. The question points, you know, rather than giving it to an individual orally, it is injected. What is the reason for that? So guys, think about the pathway of insulin as it moves from the, from the mouth. It will need to move from the mouth down the esophagus into the stomach. Being a protein, we know that in the stomach, protein digestion happens. So guys, if you orally take insulin, that insulin is going to go into the stomach. And being a protein, the insulin will be digested. Hence, making the insulin ineffective. Remember that the insulin then needs to be absorbed and the absorption only happens in the small intestine. So it means that effectively insulin will be digested as a protein in the stomach and will lose its effectiveness and not be able to assist the cells in absorbing the glucose into the bloodstream. And that's essentially why it is injected directly into the bloodstream so that it can go into the bloodstream and then effectively allow cells to absorb the glucose therefore reducing the blood glucose level. So that was an interesting question. Let's get back into right at the start when we discussed the adaptations of the jaw and the teeth of different consumers for their mode of nutrition. So this question essentially points to that. Let's read through this. Study skull A and B below and answer the questions that follow. So guys, if we stand back and reflect, here we see skull A, which clearly indicates a large canine. You can see clearly large canines in them. We're seeing very well developed uh, cheekbones. We can see triangular shaped teeth on the upper jaw and the lower jaw. This is significant in us understanding the mode of nutrition. 
And this particular skull will be that of a predator. How do I know that? I can see that you've got large canines. Let's look at skull B. Again, you can see that well-developed and significantly elongated jaw showing the presence of flattened molars and premolars. We see the absence of canines, so we see the absence of canines, but significantly well-developed incisors. This would be significant in an organism that is a herbivore, one that consumes plant material. And so you can see that the incisors help them to bite off leaves and grass, and the molars and premolars, which are well-developed, for chewing and grinding of that plant diet. And that's essentially what you able you should be able to identify when comparing the skulls of different consumers. So let's move on to a few questions based on this. Identify which skull A or B belongs to A, a herbivore. As I mentioned, herbivores are individuals that will lack canines. They have large incisors. When we compare the jaw structure of both, we can see that these individuals lack canines, but they've got well-developed incisors as well as flattened molars and premolars. The reason the molars and premolars are flattened is that when they chew, they're able to grind the plant material and release the nutrients from that, allowing for an easier process of digestion. However, if we compare that to the teeth, in the carnivore, we can see these sharp triangular teeth that are there for crushing and biting and reducing the size of the meat that is being consumed. So distinctly different is skull B, which is clearly of the herbivore. The next question points to the carnivore. And as I mentioned, the giveaway for this individual is the large canines. And also you see these teeth which are triangular shaped and it is typical found in a carnivore which consumes a diet rich in uh, meat protein that it uses its teeth to crush and to mince bone and, and protein. Right, let's see, provide reasons for your answers to the above questions. As I just pointed out, I've explained the adaptations of these, of these triangular teeth for crushing bones and the flattened teeth for grinding plant material. Guys, one last question before we have a wrap. Does skull B have carinaceal teeth? Explain your answer. Okay. No, it does not, because it's got flattened teeth. These teeth that have the triangular shape are the ones that are adapted for being a carnivorous diet. So guys, for me, that's a wrap. We've looked at revising nutrition. We've looked at various different questions from labeling parts to unpacking the structure and function of different organs. We've looked at the ability of the body to regulate the levels of blood sugars, sugar. It's important that we reflect on all of that as we wrap up your revision. For me, you've been a fantastic audience. Trust that you've enjoyed the lesson. Cheers from my side. Have a bio day. See you soon.